Hey, Michael. How you doing? Hi, Stephen. How are you? All right. Dr. Cohen. Oh, hi. Hi. How are you? Thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. Oh, thanks for the invitation. And Kathy's on here, too. All right. Great. Everybody's here. Hey, Kathy. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, oh, yeah. Hello, everyone. So, uh, I'm going to forgo my usual opening shtick because we have a really wonderful discussion planned for today's Device Squad podcast. We have three guests today. One of them is Kathy Farmer of Canopy Health. Now, Propelix has done and continues to do a lot of work for Canopy Health. We built apps and prototypes and websites and so forth. But we're not here to talk about any of that. Uh, We're actually here to talk about something a lot more important. And uh, so when we meet with clients, I always try to find some commonalities as one does, you know. And when I met Kathy Farmer at Canopy, we started talking and, uh, oh, you know, uh, you're from Boston. I'm from Boston. You went to UMass. I went to UMass. Uh, Oh, you were in a punk band in high school. Guess what? I was also in a punk band in high school. And then... (laughs) I think I overheard you talking about your brother, Michael, on the phone, and uh, who's autistic. And I said, Kathy, you're not going to believe this, but I also have an autistic brother named Michael. So, (laughs) and then I think our relationship changed at that point, because when when the thing you have in common also includes having a sibling with autism, it becomes a very different thing. That commonality is is profound. And so Kathy and I became instant friends on a very deep level because there's sort of this shared understanding uh, about what life is like growing up with an autistic sibling that transcends any business relationship. So you practically become family with that person. And uh, I don't know, maybe... Maybe growing up with an autistic sibling in the in the seventies is the kind of thing that makes you wind up in a punk band. Uh, but uh, so, so so I've I think I've tipped my hand a little bit here in terms of our subject for today. But we have three guests, which is practically a panel, and uh, we're going to be talking about digital tools for autism. So a little bit of a diversion from our usual uh, enterprise mobility topics, uh, but one that's hugely important and, uh, and I know will, will be valuable to a lot of people listening. So everybody, welcome to Device Squad, the podcast for the mobile enterprise from Propelix. Device Squad, fighting crimes against enterprise mobility worldwide. Bad UI, frustrating user experiences, Poorly conceived mobile strategies, we defeat them all. This podcast series will cover all aspects of enterprise mobility, including strategy, development, design, testing, and more. My name is Steve Brickman. I'm a mobile strategist and UX architect with Propelix. First, a brief history of the company. Founded in 2011, Propelix is a mobile strategy consultancy helping enterprises worldwide devise true mobile strategies and develop world-class mobile applications across all industry verticals. Propelix clients include large companies like Amway, Bright Horizons, Bank of Montreal, Dubai Airports, Family Dollar, DLL, Cintas, Merck, and many more. Propelix menu of services includes eight different mobile kickstarts, covering everything from mobile strategy and road mapping to MCOE to UI UX design to mobile testing strategy, along with soup to nuts, app design development and support. Additionally, Propelix offers three homegrown enterprise mobile products. I'll introduce each of you and then if you could just tell us a bit about your background and about your relationship with autism, that would be great. Kathy, I've already mentioned you, so why don't you start it off? Okay. Kathy Schwally Farmer here. I live in Berkeley, California. I started off as a programmer, uh, uh, early days of Windows, <laughs> and I've uh, been in tech for a long time, and I've been working with startups for the last uh, roughly uh, seven, eight years. <clears throat> I'm a mother of two. I have um, five siblings, um, and two of my brothers are on the spectrum. 
Michael, as um, Steve said, is, um, is, has classic autism, Rain Manish. And then I have a brother, Tom, who was diagnosed in his 30s. Michael was diagnosed when he was roughly three. Uh, and Tom was diagnosed in his 30s because that was sort of the spectrum had grown. Uh, Michael was the first person at the Cleveland Clinic to be diagnosed. But my father was a big advocate for autism, and he was one of the founders of the Organization for Autism Research. And he just passed away this year, which was a big loss. He started scholarships and things for people on the spectrum, was one of the first to do that, started group homes, et cetera. Because when he was finding support for my brother, there wasn't much, you know. So I'm continuing that legacy, and I'm on the board for Organization for Autism Research. But I'll let you go to the other guests. Sure. Uh, Michael McWaters, you want to go next? Sure. So I'm Michael. Uh, I live in Brooklyn, New York. I work for TED as user experience uh, lead at TED. I have twin boys who are uh, eight, almost nine, Colin and Martin. And Colin is autistic. And he was diagnosed uh, shortly before his third birthday. I'm given a diagnosis of classic autism, but he has kind of a very um, interesting neurology. It's kind of all over the map. So it's it's really interesting. And I always say, if I'd been smarter, I would have been a neuroscientist because um, I always loved neuroscience. As a designer, having um, a child with autism has really been interesting to me because it's reinvigorated my interest in meaningful and purposeful design. My wife, she has a sibling who's autistic. Of course, at the time she wasn't diagnosed as autistic, she was diagnosed as mentally retarded. But obviously, with time, we've come to realize that, no, she actually was autistic or is autistic. So that shaped her experience and thus shaped our experience, um, having an autistic child. I have used my skills to do a lot of um, advocacy for autism. I started a blog. I run a Facebook page with a lot of information and resources. I created an app to help parents understand whether their children might be showing signs of autism. And I have an ongoing project which is involved with redesigning the autism spectrum in a more meaningful and clinically accurate way. And I've been working with a few neuroscientists and neuropsychologists uh, who are specialists in the area to kind of help me do that. So it's, it's really been kind of a passion project for me. And then obviously being here at TED, I've gotten to touch autism in some ways, like getting to interview Steve Silberman, who wrote the great book Neurotribes, helping to curate our autism playlist and kind of generally being our resident autism expert. Great. Thank you. Lastly, we have Dr. Alexander Lee Cohen. Yes. And so I'm, I'm actually coming to autism late in my career in one sense, but I'm just getting started. So I'm, I live here in Boston also, but I originally trained at Washington University in St. Louis where I trained in biology and biomedical physics, and I had intended to go into computer science and biomedical engineering, but got fascinated by the brain with all its complexities. Um, I ended up going on and getting a, both my MD and my PhD there at neuroscience, uh, where I started learning about how to define how the brain is put together. I went up to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, where I did a child neurology training and then came to Boston to try and specialize in, in behavioral neurology and in autism in particular as a in one sense, a model system of how the brain can go down a different trajectory and just how that happens just started to fascinate me. And now that I help diagnose and manage these patients on a day-to-day -day basis, it's become a bit more of a passion for me as well. But I actually spend the majority of my time in the research lab doing imaging research with MRI data from children with autism, but also other children and adults to try and understand, again, how the brain's put together, but also how we can diagnose autism from an objective or brain anatomy or, or function standpoint, uh, or even how we can just localize specific symptoms and come up with treatments that are focused on specific symptoms that lots of children with autism share, even if they don't have the same cause of their autism. So it's, it's become a bit of my, my life's work of moving forward. Great. Thank you. And let me just tell a little bit about my own brother. My older brother was born in uh, 1966. And I think it's just fascinating how much autism has changed since then. He was first diagnosed at age eight. I just spoke with my mom this morning to clarify these facts because I found that hard to believe that it took that long. But she said that age eight was the first time that they heard the word autism and that prior to that, they called it congenital encephalopathy. And now my own daughter, Noah, who's uh, 10 years old, has been diagnosed with generalized anxiety, ADHD, 
But what's interesting about her case is that it's kind of ironic where in the 60s, they didn't know what to diagnose Michael with. It's the same thing is happening with Noah because uh, she's like such a mild case that teachers and therapists keep sort of coming back to saying that she's on the spectrum. Her pediatrician says she's not on the spectrum. And now her psychologist that she's seeing now suggesting that maybe she is on the spectrum again. So just kind of fascinating how that's come back around. Just to give you an idea of how much some of these therapies have changed, if you can even call it a therapy. Uh, When my brother was at the Franciscan Children's Center from age five on, I think, he, he has a tendency to get up and walk around at night. And we found out later, one of the things they did was that the nuns would actually tie him down to the bed to keep him from walking around. So my parents learned about that after the fact. You know, that that was the trend. They used also uh, aversive therapies, which were really just forms of corporal punishment, slapping and hitting to sort of correct those with extreme behavioral problems. I remember going into a residence that he was at in Lowell called Amic and and seeing a just sort of like a phone booth shaped room in there and looking into it. And there was like a pair of handcuffs. Presumably, they would just handcuff kids in there when they were having trouble acting out and so forth. Thankfully, we've come a long way since then. Well, we had the similar, because my brother is slightly older than your brother, maybe by a few years. There were cages in some of the places that my parents looked at. You know, when he became a teenager, it was very difficult for him to be at the house because he was going through a combination of everything else and then hormones. There were some places my parents saw and just ran out. Uh, They were horrific. And so I'm not surprised to hear your stories. Back in the 60s, you know, the rate of autism was 1 in 10,000. I also saw some different numbers, like 1 in 2,500. And now it's 1 in 68. At least it was a few years ago. So, Dr. Cohen, how much of this rise is due to the reclassification of autism and Asperger's as a spectrum disorder, broadening the criteria, and how much is just more autism? And this is a really good question that's been brought up several times in in several different venues too, and we have long extended conversations about it. But a large part of the consensus seems to be that, you know, part of it is due to broadening the diagnosis, or rather instead of going from trying to split things into sensory integration disorder and Asperger's and autism and Rett syndrome was considered to be a separate diagnosis to actually realizing that there isn't a phenotypic difference between them. So we're going to consider them all to be autism spectrum disorder and everyone has slightly different impact from that diagnosis or a different collection of symptoms under that umbrella. So part of it is due to that as from a just a pure mathematical standpoint, you're increasing the, the number. But I think a large part of it has actually been an increase in awareness. You know, there's more clinicians out there that are aware of autism as being a, a separate diagnosis. So it's, it's, it's distinct from intellectual disability or, or what was called retardation. And I, so I think, I think a large part of it has just been an increase in the ability to screen and surveil patients throughout the world. We've seen that areas that have more knowledge of these conditions seem to have higher rates of diagnosis, but it doesn't seem to be rising in certain areas more so than others that would be related to any environmental factor or such. The concept that we're combining everything into a signal diagnosis is, is one big factor, and I think the, the, the increased awareness is, is potentially the other. There's always the nagging worry that there actually is an, an actual increase in incidence over time. Um, and this, this is an open question because we keep changing the diagnosis. How do you do these kind of studies? And it's, it's very, very difficult to do, and, and I don't think we have a, a, a perfect answer about whether or not there actually is an increase in pure incidence, but I, I don't think it's as dramatic as the numbers would say. We've come so far with autism. What, what do we know now that we didn't know then when it comes to like the neurobiology? Do we have any answers, or is well, it still a mystery? Yeah, so we, we've learned a lot by studying patients that have specific genetic mutations. So right now in 2017, if you send every patient with autism or rather all the patients with autism that have had 
whole exome sequencing. So looking at the DNA and all of the genes that are expressed into protein and in all of the chromosomes, you get a yield of perhaps 20 to 30%. So that means that 70 to 80% of children who have autism or adults who have autism, we don't have an identified genetic cause. It's not to say it isn't genetic, we just haven't identified it yet, or perhaps there is an environmental cause that we haven't identified or something that happened in development. Um, but by studying people with specific genetic mutations, we found that there's certain pathways in the brain from a developmental standpoint that are very strongly implicated, and it's not a 100% overlap with intellectual disability. There seems to be some differentiation. There's been some work looking at, is it specific neurotransmitters, such as GABA in the brain, is was one neurotransmitter that's been implicated many different times. But one of the hallmarks of studies in autism has been that no matter what we look at, we seem to find differences in a lot of different levels of organization of the brain and a lot of different ways that we study the brain. Visually, and when you, if you look at imaging of the brain structurally, we don't identify any differences after someone is fully grown. There are some expansions or some areas that seem to grow faster from six to 12 months, and then they kind of normalize or they change over time. But what's happening in those areas of the brain is, is a really an open question. And again, we're not sticking all six, we're not going to stick all six month olds in an MRI machine with sedation. And even then, these differences are not so great that uh, you could use them as a diagnostic tool right now. So we're hoping to get there someday. So the differences seem to be widespread across the whole brain. Um, they seem to have some specific changes, but not specific enough that we could use them as a diagnostic tool. Yeah, so hopefully someday we'll figure out if there is a, something that's more distinct. And we do see a tremendous amount of heterogeneity. All of the children with autism, all the adults with autism, whether they have a specific genetic mutation or not, have a very large variation in what symptoms they're going to have. That seems to be a big hallmark and what has caused so much confusion about trying to make the diagnosis, just as, as you yourself have experienced, one clinician says, yes, they're on the spectrum. The other clinician says, well, no, they're not. In their heads, they're using different criteria, even when it's the same person in front of them. So I think it's a developing story that there's been thousands of, of man hours put into this. And I think it's, unfortunately, it's going to continue to take another couple thousand man hours before we really have a, a good idea of what is the core final common pathway from all these different causes that lead to a relatively similar phenotype. I remember this was back in like the 80s. I think my brother took part in a program called Facilitation. Michael or Kathy, I don't know if you remember. You mean like Facilitated Communication? Yeah. I'm not sure if that's been debunked. I mean, it certainly seemed shady when my brother was involved with it. I mean, perhaps it works for those who are, you know, less severely autistic. But for my brother, it seemed like a long shot. Essentially, what, what happens during these sessions is there's a facilitator who holds your child's hand and then helps them point to a, a letter on a keyboard. and the thinking was that by sort of shifting the child over to using more gross motor movements, right? I think that was the idea. That child was then able to actually point to letters and tap out words and sentences and so forth. But I remember seeing videos where the kids weren't even looking at the keyboard or anything like that while, you know, these letters are being produced. So I'm not sure how much of a Ouija board effect there is there. And I'm, I'm not sure if this is even considered a valid tool anymore. I don't know if any of you have any more insight. I do know that, yeah, there was a lot of debunking that happened. Basically, one way that they would do it was they would have, you know, the facilitator leave the room and ask yeah. uh, the autistic person a question and then have the facilitator come back. And they were unable to answer. So that's kind of an indicator. But at the same time, I, you know, I've gotten to know some folks with autism who've really helped me kind of understand advocacy and so forth. And it, and it turns out, like many things, there are some forms of FC that seem to have some validity uh, to them. There's a book that made waves, at least in the parent community, called The Reason I Jump. It's uh, written by a young Japanese boy who's nonverbal, who started out using a form of FC because of his gross motor issues, but now, now points at letters on his own and is able to transcribe basically a very articulate book. 
uh, of course, in the back of my mind, there's always a small bit of skepticism because, you know, it's just, I think it's a healthy way to be. But I think that's very different than actually guiding someone's arm and holding them while they're not looking at a keyboard. And I, I would just like to say, I mean, to that point, as a parent, one of the things that I'm very motivated toward as a skeptical person and as a parent is to kind of help uh, parents and caregivers avoid a lot of these traps. I think there's a lot of people out there who range from well-meaning to you know, self-serving who would like to take advantage of the vulnerability of parents to try to get them to spend money and time doing things that they shouldn't be doing when there's actually proven therapies that do work as well as just kind of being a decent person to your child. Steve, I was going to say, I never saw that um, particular therapy that you're referring to. We were dealing with more you know, negative and positive reinforcement and particularly negative reinforcement in the 70s. And my parents were told by a care team of therapists that they needed to create a timeout room. So we converted one of our closets into a timeout room. And that was a horrific experience for all of us because um, they were conducting research and we were, you know, naive family, right? As most of us would be in the 70s. And it was a lot of tears. And Michael didn't gain any value out of the negative uh, reinforcement. And I don't know if the findings out of our family experiment helped any entity. We were living in Illinois at the time, but we all have, every one of us has really strong memories of putting Michael in that closet. And it was, uh, it was, it didn't add value to him or to us. It was, it was really, really trying as a family to, to do that. We just wanted to help them. And we didn't know there was no roadmap, right? For family. When you're dealing with, you know, a tween and how do you, how do you deal with the behavior? So, yeah. Yeah. I think we all have valid reasons for being skeptical. I mean, when you consider that, you know, they originally were blaming the parents for autistic children and the, the, the term refrigerator mothers was, was a real thing, Yeah, which, you know, is the opposite of how I would describe my own mother. I'm sure that's true across the board. When Michael was diagnosed the first person at the Cleveland Clinic. The doctor looked at my mother. Now he was the fourth of six, right? And the doctor said to my mother, how can you live with this wild animal? Oh, gosh. Yeah. It's crazy the things that people say. We had a neighbor's um, babysitter was over one day. Um, This is when my son was younger, and they were doing a play date. And she looked at my wife. She said, do you love him? And my wife says, looked at her like, of course I do. She goes, I don't know if I could love a child like that. And we're just like, what are you talking about? You know? (laughs) So thankfully, these tools and therapies have come a long way. So hopefully uh, the rest of this conversation will be a much more enjoyable one. So, yeah. For instance, how have our thoughts around building digital tools and therapies for autistic children and adults evolved? I'll start. I have also a brother-in-law with autism who's nonverbal, just to add to some of the other multi-stories, multi-family stories. And he started off using, you know, laminated pointing sheets with characters and letters and things. Not really letters so much because his IQ wasn't enough for that necessarily, but a lot of uh, imagery. And it's moved from those point laminated sheets to pretty decent tablets that really help communicating. And I would say for him in particular, technology has really evolved and let him have a richer life to communicate than he could before. From a research perspective, there's there's been a fair number of things that have come out to be pretty consistent that have helped point the app development or program development in certain directions. For instance, Children with autism or patients with autism seem to have a very strong increased focus on the detail over the gestalt, over the entire picture itself. And so that reducing visual complexity can be very helpful. So they're not trying to pay attention to detail all over the screen. You know, using an idiom or metaphor, even if it's a visual idiom, can be difficult sometimes. They, it requires an extra step of thought. And so just saying delete file versus a picture of a trash can can sometimes you know, trip people up. Some patients and some families have a lot of difficulty with transitions. So having a built-in process, not just in the apps, but also just in day-to-day life, we're leaving in 10 minutes. Now we're leaving in five minutes. And you can build that into 
a user interface very nicely as well. And so I think I've, I've seen a lot more of that come out in, the, in recent time too. That makes me wonder if anybody's thought to develop something like an autism OS that would take traditional interaction paradigms that we're all used to and sort of just modify them, you know, in a way that would be more usable for autistics. That's a great idea, Steve. I mean, it would take a lot of work, but it, maybe maybe there's something there. Because I'm just wondering how much is um, just sort of porting traditional therapies like Kathy, like what you were talking about, laminated pictures and so forth, and putting them on a device versus using the device in sort of a transformative way that utilizes the actual features of the device to provide some sort of novel therapy that would otherwise be unavailable. We could brainstorm that for like a many hours. There's some wonderful opportunity because it's a community, right? A community that wants to help each other. We want to help therapists and teachers and families and all those on the spectrum of practitioners, et cetera. So anything like what you're describing, maybe Michael knows about it, um, but I, I don't know anything like that just yet. But I think we're just on the crust of things like this happening. I get the Google alerts of all the autism stuff daily, and there's some good stuff that's coming out. There's some great stuff in the ed tech world. I know LiftEd has a great app. Um, I know the founder there. And um, they're helping the transition with parent and teachers to document what's going on with the child with an iPad and make it really easy. And the learnings in this community of autism tech are so much more unique than in a lot of other areas of tech because people want to help each other because there's usually a passion or a connection just like we all have here. It's not about anything about making money. It's really about making things accessible and valuable to those who are touched by it, right? So let's just back up a bit. So when we talk about digital tools for autistic or digital therapies and so forth, what is the general approach? What are we trying to help with? You know, what are these apps trying to tackle? I come at it from a slightly different perspective, and it's obviously informed by my son, Colin, and the way he approaches the world. You know, he has deep and obsessive interests, and he's very passionate about them for short periods, maybe three months, maybe six months. And he's also fortunate to, uh, you know, as, as both of you were pointing out, grow, have grown up in a time of a, a bit more understanding or a lot more understanding. And, you know, kind of the rise of the digital revolution, you know, like devices you can touch and get instantaneous responses from. So initially, I was downloading a lot of autism apps for him and then kind of moving my way away from them into kind of more general apps like Toka Boca is a, is a line of apps that were great because they're like game apps. Um, they're not really like game in the sense that you're trying to complete a mission, but you're just kind of exploring worlds, but there's a lot of social stories within them. So one of them might be like Toka Lab or Toka Kitchen, and you're kind of going through those experiences. And what I found with him and what I've seen with a lot of other autistic kids is that their interests aren't actually so far afield it's their approach to these things that's different. Mm -hmm. And so it depends on the particular app that he happens to be using. For example, right now, because there's a song that he heard about weather, he's become really interested in weather. So now the weather app is his favorite app. And he can tell you the weather every day he checks the weather because he loves the sound of the word Abu Dhabi. So he can tell you the weather in Abu Dhabi every day. And then because he's very good with numbers, he's very interested in kind of Celsius versus Fahrenheit. And that led to conversations about that. So I've found in some ways, at least with him and with other kids, it's less about specific autism apps. Now, I'm setting aside, you know, highly clinical apps like assistive communication devices and things like that, but more kind of just the app world opening up, you know, whole new experiences for him that are instantaneous and kind of feed his brain and then allow me to have a connection with him. So, for example, he fell in love through the, through the music app, Spotify app, with the music to the musical Hamilton. So, you know, we started talking about Hamilton to him and, and, the, and the history, and then he started going to the Wikipedia app and looking at presidents. So, but again, everything through his, through his lens is through numbers. So he can tell you the age of all the presidents, mm -hmm. the years they were president, you know, how tall they were, the heaviest president, which happens to be Taft, Trump is second, mm -hmm. if you're interested. Um, <laughs> so, and Abraham Lincoln was the tallest. I think James Madison was the shortest. But anyway, so all of these things become not just a way for him to explore the world, in kind of a slightly less confrontational way than maybe you know direct contact, which he does love, but on his own terms. 
but also it becomes a great bridge for us to kind of connect with him over these interests and, and sit over his shoulder and, and see what he's doing. How are the apps letting him investigate those ideas any differently than just doing, you know, like a Google search or going on Wikipedia or opening up Spotify? Yeah, I, I mean, maybe he'll get to that point when he's older. Um, like his twin has actually discovered Google, much to my chagrin, like, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, and then YouTube and this, so we've had to restrict, put restrictions around that. But I think there's actually, and this is, again, related to him, but I think also relates to other children as well, or many other children in that scene. It's because it's slightly more structured. So rather than just being open-ended, it gives him a toehold from which he can then start to make sense of the story and then dig deeper on his own versus a search field, which is just kind of, you know, he wouldn't necessarily know where to start with that. But there's a provocation, whether it's a, an app like Tokoboka that has a social setting or a music app or whether where he's actually looking at the numbers which interest him. So there's kind of an already predefined provocation for him. Yeah, you know, I just happened to catch, I think it was actually a TED Talk by Temple Grandin. Mm-hmm where she mentioned something similar to what you're saying, where if you asked an autistic or somebody with Asperger's to develop an app, they would have trouble doing that with such a a wide open request. But if you tell them, okay, well, we need the app to do this and it needs to use up so much memory, then they would be much more successful. That's right. So another example is a very close friend of mine has an 11-year-old boy who's nonverbal, but very bright. And my friend noticed that he started creating kind of YouTube mashups where he would take the computer on his own and use the soundtrack from one song and the video from another song. To kind of, he figured all of this out on his own. And so my friend actually got him into a program, I don't know if it's regional or, or just local to Brooklyn, called Sonic Arts, where they work with kids not special needs kids, but all kids to kind of help them learn to develop music production skills. Well, they were really interested in taking Noah on, that's his son. And he's just having a blast kind of learning to mix music, um, learning to sit at a, at a mixer and, and create his own music and visuals. So again, that's also a very social experience because he's connecting with other people through the medium of technology. That's great. How about the social piece? So our daughter, Noah, her main issues are around understanding social behaviors, like the, so, the, the things that you and I take for granted and understand intuitively without even thinking about them, she has real trouble with. As a result, her social development is stunted, and I think she avoids social interactions because she feels uncomfortable that she lacks this intuitive understanding of how people interact. Are there any apps out there that deal with this piece? There are apps that do what are called social stories. And if, you, you know, if you've ever dealt with social stories, oftentimes they're laminated or they're books or they're printouts. We give Colin a lot of social stories that explain to him beforehand, like if we're going to go uh, do something, it'll kind of like to the dentist, it'll explain what the dentist is and what he can expect, what it'll be like and what will happen afterwards. You know, there's a lot of anxiety associated with autism due to, I think, struggles with uncertainty. And so this kind of demystifies the experience in, in advance. Um, there are apps that do that. But I, I have to say, you know, it's not, a, it's not an app on a computer, but on TV, my son is eight, but he still likes to watch shows like Peg Plus Cat and Daniel Tiger, which are you know, geared towards younger kids, but they're very social stories. And, you know, they're, they're how do we get along in classroom and how do we talk to our friends? And he seems fascinated by them. I, I can't say he's necessarily integrating them into his everyday activities, but he definitely watches them and is very interested. And if I ask him, why did that happen? Well, because he was angry. You know, he, he gets it on a, on a level, even though maybe in the day-to-day, it's harder for him to act on it. There's an important part of that that is, is very telling, is that in Daniel Tiger and in some of these other, you know, more story-formatted TVs, they explicitly say the why. Like when, when Daniel Tiger right. says to people, do they say he did that because he was angry? So they're they're very ex- explicit and, and they reinforce what's going on inside of each character's head. And you lose that when you start looking at the television designed for older children, which that's perhaps something that could be added back in for people with autism, kind of a running subtitles of what people are actually thinking when they're doing certain actions. My Little Pony is kind of the same way in that yeah. people with Asperger's really, even adults, enjoy watching My Little Pony because it gives them these life lessons, you know, from totally a source you would not expect. 
But I got to add also that this used to bum me out so much. Noah used to watch this like uh, Little Einstein show and I hated it because they don't interact with each other the way normal people interact with each other. If you've ever watched this show (laughs) where they have the spaceship and everything, like the dialogue is so strange. So I'm wondering if that had some influence on her because she used to watch it pretty regularly. And just the way they solve problems, the way they interact is all just very bizarre. I'm sure watching Looney Tunes when I was a kid influenced me too. <laughs> Maybe not always for the better. <laughs> That's true. Uh, yeah, I guess you have a point there. We're not like hitting each other with you know, planks of wood or anvils or anything. One thing on the social front, which is interesting is, and again, maybe I'm wrong and I don't want to overgeneralize as, as, as I'm sure Kathy and, and Dr. Cohen know, like you never want to generalize when it comes yeah. to autism because there are few, but I've kind of adopted the belief, you know, presume competence, presume that, you know, these things are a spectrum. They're, they're not necessarily any, any behavior or any symptom isn't necessarily, you know, discrete from a natural human behavior. It's just the frequency and intensity of it. And so like an example of, how that plays out is, you know, with Colin, he doesn't interact with kids his own age. He doesn't walk up to them and ask. I mean, if he does, it's very awkward and probably uncomfortable for the other kid, but he's slightly more comfortable with adults. And I think part of the reason for that is because children are much more unpredictable and they're, you know, they're wilder and they're louder and it's less a known quantity what you're going to get. Whereas adults, you know, we follow more rules. And so I tend to think that you know, I, I know he's always going to be autistic and, and he's always going to have his own approach to the world, obviously, but I try not to worry too much about the fact that he doesn't have these social relationships now as long as he has an interest in them. And he, he does seem to develop connections, deep connections to strangers, you know, his teachers and other kids in class. It's just the way that they manifest is different. That's kind of more directed to you, Steve, with your daughter, Noah. Yeah, Noah's very much the same way, but maybe a bit milder of a case. So we talked about this idea of creating a world with less detail, sort of a digital environment that's less detailed to make it easier for a child to navigate through it. What are some other general approaches, if there are any, that we can talk about when it comes to creating tools for autism or digital therapies and things like that? Are there any other like general approaches that hold true? Well, I don't know if you want to touch on VR yet, but the conversation we were just having around the stories are richer with VR therapy. And I know that everything is just beginning there. You and I, Steve, are connected to that Facebook group where the founder of um, Florio started, a VJ Robindron. And that is still in pilot. And then I know there's other researchers who are doing, you know, VR therapy in the autism space. It's an interesting combination of technology and therapy, given the conversations around the stories and the social skills and, you know, having, if you will, a virtual practice session of these things will really help children. It doesn't do very much, I think, for the adults. It may at some point. My brother is not using any VR tools, but um, I do think the opportunity is very significant. One of the big advantages that VR has, and and we get this to a lesser extent with any form of technology, is the, the ability to customize and personalize the experience. As we've talked about, people with autism are affected in many different ways. And for one person, they may be uh, very turned away and, and have a lot of difficulty with strong stimuli or with loud sounds. Someone else might need things to be loud or are attracted to high contrast things. So the the ability to customize or change the environment, I think, is going to be very important. Um, And with VR, you have much more control over that completely, uh, other than having to wear the headset, of course. But I think you can very carefully construct and then gradually change the environment to help bring people closer and closer to what the external reality is like. In terms of things that I think about, when when if if I were ever to start designing an app specifically towards autistic children, there are a few thoughts that come to mind. You know, this is good app design 101 in any case, but make them as dead quick and simple to get onboarded as possible. Like if there's a steep learning curve, you know, parents oftentimes are trying to help the kid, and so you want to make it as quick and immediate as possible. 
because you know you lose attention almost immediately and also intuitiveness obviously is even more important you know plan for gross and and fine motor deficiencies so things shouldn't be overly difficult you know i think a certain level of control over things like volume and pace are important um, subtitling can be very helpful because there is a lot of noise coming at somebody. Maybe it's hard to understand the words that are being spoken. So subtitles can help um, reinforce. I noticed we actually leave subtitles on on our TV, and I think that's actually helped Colin with his comprehension a lot of what's being said because he can focus visually and, and read. And then also, and this is something I learned recently from an older autistic friend, is that one of the big passion points for many people with Asperger's, not, I mean, not again to generalize, but it's actually anime and things. And one thing my friend told me was that, well, it's actually because the expressions are so obvious. The eyes are so large, the smiles are so big, the anger is so pronounced that it, the social cues become much more comprehensible. I review probably 40 college applications for people on the spectrum looking for scholarships every year. And the number of students that are applying for these scholarships who are into anime, music right. videos, and obviously computer science as well, but it was surprising in reading um, a lot of the girls who are on the spectrum, but it's just, it's wonderful to see, and it's great that there's uh, some interesting growth opportunities for them in these places like this. Yeah, it's a form of expression that's very understandable and relatable without kind of a lot of hidden social cues. The other thing I would say is that I helped a young innovator entrepreneur who's trying to develop a kind of a robotic device called Leica for children with autism. Um, he's actually pretty far along. I mean, he's actually sent one of the versions that I have at my desk and I'm going to bring home to Colin this week. So his device is based on a lot of uh, looking at kids interact with it. And he found like a lot of the robots were trying to be a proxy for a person, you know, but then it's kind of artificial. But the idea was, you know, not necessarily wrong, but the idea was, well, it's like a less threatening person. But his, right. his is actually not geared that way. His is actually geared to where this little ball-shaped robot that moves and lights up and has eyes and things, so it's very friendly and approachable and fun, is actually geared to create social connections between an autistic child and, and another child or an adult. So the way the kind of games it does and the kind of interactions it has gives you kind of a mutual focus. That's really kind of an interesting approach for any kind of software or app or anything you're devising is not to think of something that just satisfies this one person's interest, but as a connector or a bridge to other people that might be in the room or with them. That's really interesting, especially when you think about this idea of a, of a robot as being something that facilitates interaction with other children versus something that facilitates interaction with the device itself. Exactly. That's, That's just awesome. A, it's called, it's called yeah. Leica for anybody who's interested in looking it up. It's like a connector with their social skills where there's a void. It's like a connector to allow for that. It sounds wonderful. There's no reason why an app can't do that either. No, definitely. And I mean, like, I, that's why I was mentioning just music apps in general, because we can listen to music with Colin and talk about the music and, and sing with him. I mean, it just becomes something for us to focus on together. There's been a, a conversation about this similarly with kind of like texting and with online verbal communication, too, because in, in one sense, it levels the playing field. If, if any of us text a message or if someone with autism texts a message, the only transmission that there is is just those words on the page. There's no requirement that you have to pick up on my facial cues or my body language or anything else. But at the same time, it doesn't provide the opportunity for learning those things. So it definitely has a place in all of this as far as you know, helping people connect. But I, I think it has a ceiling effect. You know, it's funny. And this, again, makes the case for coming up with some kind of OS for autism or a, and a mobile OS for autism. Six months ago, we got my daughter an iPod Touch. We didn't want to get her an iPod Touch, but she's very uh, persistent when she wants something. <laughs> so we finally caved. And well, we got her the iPod Touch on the pretense that she would text with her friends, which she has not done. Her friends are texting. A lot of the kids in her class are sending messages back and forth. But she is just sort of a passive observer, and she'll just like read the text but she never responds to texts even when they're sent directly to her. <laughs> and we tell her like, no, you have to respond, you know, and with texting, like people almost expect you to respond like right away, you know? So if you're not responding, they're going to take that as being some kind of a, like an insult or uh, just a neglect of some kind, you know? 
I don't think that that's helped. But like you say, if the texting were somehow modified to appear as something else on her device, maybe it would become more encouraging to interact. Right, a reinforcer of sorts. Yeah, maybe some some more reinforcement piece. The other thing I wanted to mention was, uh, it's kind of funny, we're talking about virtual reality. I just did a podcast episode about VR and AR, and it sounds like so much right now is hanging upon the technology piece. The fact that in order to utilize AR, VR, you have to strap on this giant headset, you know, or you have to put on a pair of glasses that make you look like a cyborg. And like, once we figure that piece out, because that holds true with, with autism Asperger's, right? You've got the sensory issues that kids have. They would maybe be even less inclined to put on um, something that covers their eyes and is tightly strapped to their face and has maybe loud sounds and appears bright to them and so forth. So it's just interesting how much is <laughs> is hanging upon this technology. When will it get here where you don't need to have that giant rectangle on your face? Well, just like we were talking about earlier where there's no one size fits all, literally, with the VR device, I think that's going to be the challenge with making this work for a wide range of people on the spectrum is that some people... Will get their ears will turn red. Some people can't handle anything touching their eyes. You know all the OCD ish stuff, and so I think that's something that we have yet to see because it's such it's such net new technology to see how it impacts those on the spectrum. Because I just think it's too soon for us to know. And I I think that's why we're seeing some of these VR AR solutions are going to be in pilot longer because those are some of the dynamics that are added complexity that we don't have in traditional app creations. You know. Right. I mean, but it has so much utility for things like phobias and things of VR and AR, where it just, it enables you to provide exposure to those things, but in a perfectly safe environment. Right. I tend to, right now, and this is probably just my limited thinking, think a little bit more VR and more of a clinical or, you know, a teaching setting or a caregiving setting, at least initially. But I do think AR has great potential for kind of out and about, you know, how to approach the world confusing situations, picking up on social signals, even as a way to communicate with somebody where you can type out what you're saying and show them. I'm actually really interested in how that progresses as a form of kind of facilitation between the world and a person who's autistic. I'm thinking about encouraging communication, the applications there where my daughter is like your son, where she will not go up to a kid her age and say, hey, how you doing? You know, I'm Noah or whatever. But she's very good at following directions. So, for instance, there's a local farm here, and they said, we're getting some new bees in for the farm. And I thought, oh, this is great. I'll take Noah, and we'll go, and we'll uh, watch them install these new bees into the hives. And then we get there, and next thing I know, we're getting suited up in bee suits, Mm -hmm. and we're going to be the ones putting the bees (laughs) into the hives. And I'm like, oh, my God, how is Noah going to react to this? But Noah was perfectly calm through the whole thing, even though we're literally standing in a swarm of bees. <laughs> and it was all because she knew that because she had that bee suit on, that she was safe. Right. So similarly, if she had like an AR thing on and she could walk down the street and see somebody she knew, somebody she didn't know, whatever. And let's say that person talked to them and let's say the AR device popped up. You may be like three optional uh, responses that she could say to that person. I think that would be extremely helpful because she would trust that the device knew what it was talking about. Right. Or or even building in some some, uh, facial recognition where it just puts uh, happy, angry, upset over each each person that you walk up to so you know who to approach and who not to. Exactly, yeah. There's this combination of artificial intelligence and voice recognition and facial recognition. All this stuff is going to be possible very, very soon. What are the main end goals of these applications? Would you say it's mostly behavior modification, uh, mostly like environmental tolerance or uh, education, or just like the ability to experience the digital world you know, as much as the average neurotypical person does. What's the average goal? 
I would say the goals of the general applications are to improve you know, education, care, and growth for the autistic child, teen, or adult, and also support you know, the families and then any other practitioners. I think that's the simplest, highest level view of the goal. But obviously, key things, because communication is such a key issue and social behavior is such a key issue, you know, sub goals around those, um, depending on the individual, would be key. For me, it's some variety of all of the above. There's times when I just want Colin to have fun in a meaningful way, like, you know, so there, there's definitely entertainment, but entertainment that I know he's going to relate to. Um, there's certainly education, just like any kid, I want him to be able to use technology to learn and grow. For me, everything comes down to helping him be as you know, self-realized and independent as possible. So in terms of any kind of app that's trying to do something in a sort of you know, therapeutic way, I'm kind of hoping that it helps him navigate the world, understand social relations, not become normal because that's not my interest at all for him. He is unique and wonderful and I love him, but just to become the best Colin he can be and as independent as he can be in the world and, and feel as comfortable in the world as possible. Michael, do you want to talk about the app that you developed? Oh, sure. I was actually going to say, you know, we've been talking a lot about apps for children. And so I actually see a big dearth of technology for many of the people that come and work with my kid or in the school. You know, the, the ABA therapists that come, you know, they have these big binders and books. But, you know, you go to the doctor and everything is still paper-based mostly. And, and I noticed, you know, a lot of the things are just very kind of rudimentary and still kind of stuck in the mid 20th century. So Colin was born, he developed a very rare pediatric lung disease and was on oxygen for three years. So we kind of walked around with an oxygen tank and it was kind of unusual. And we had this pediatrician who blew off our concerns about what we thought might be, you know, some autistic, or we didn't know what it was, but he wasn't meeting some milestones. And he said, you know, well, he's just a sick kid on oxygen. You need to leave him alone. And we were like, but yeah, but you know, there's some other things looking at his twin that he's just not doing. And then he started to kind of you know, not progress, you know, at that two-year-old mark where you start to see a lot of progress. So I actually went online and, and started to download MChat and ADOS and other things and started to fill these things out and started to write down what I thought were the symptoms um, or the signs that we were concerned about. So we went to see another pediatrician who spent 45 minutes with Colin and immediately said, your son's autistic. You need to go get a formal evaluation. So we did that at Weill Cornell and the first thing the diagnostician says, she says, so why do you think your son is autistic or might be on the spectrum? And I said, well, and I handed her these two pieces of paper that had all of our thoughts. And she said, well, you've just shaved an hour off of my evaluation. This is incredibly helpful. Mm -hmm. So what that led me to think was, you know, because I'm a designer and I'm always trying to solve problems, was that a lot of parents go through this phase of not knowing. Like, is it, isn't it? You know, is this just normal? You know, and a lot of times it is. And so what I did was I was working for a technology firm at the time and we were trying to get, this was early days of iOS and I was trying to help them kind of develop a pilot project through a hack week kind of thing. And so using at that time, the DSM-4, um, as well as some other criteria, we created this app called Questioning Autism. And essentially it takes you through a series of yes, no questions um, and there's explanations of what each of them means. So you can dig deeper and say, you know, like, well, what is this particular, what exactly are you asking me to look for? And at the end, because it's not a diagnostic tool, we're very careful not to do that. It says, you know, yes, your child might be showing signs. No, your child's not showing signs. Or, you know, if you have concerns, you should see your pediatrician. But it also allows you to take notes all the way through and then share them with other people like a doctor or print them out. Unfortunately, it's no longer in the app store because I'm not with that firm anymore, but it was getting really great reviews from parents because a lot of the things you, you meet with a doctor and you don't really know what to say. They say, well, why do you think your child's autistic? And suddenly the words escape you. You're like, well, I don't know. He's, you know, you don't have the clinical terms. This kind of demystifies it for you. And it gives you the words to know, well, these are based on the clinical criteria. One of my sons had been diagnosed with ADHD and we had to fill out these surveys you know, and the teacher had a thought of survey. Are the questions that you have in questioning autism similar? Yes, exactly. We wanted to make it fairly short and succinct. And they were basically based off of the, I think at the time, the 12 criteria that the DSM-4 had, the 12 kind of points. And then it did a little math and said the same thing the DSM said, is if you're showing like nine or more of them, and I may be getting the numbers incorrect, so I apologize. But then it leans towards, hey, you probably want to go get an evaluation. If it's six or more, well, you may be, and maybe you want to go talk to your pediatrician. And if it's less than that, 
you know, if you still have concerns, you may want to, but it was basically reframing those in ways that a parent or a non medical professional would understand. Like, does your child do this? And then an explanation of what that might be. You know, does he focus on an object for a long period of time at the exclusion of other objects? And then it gives you, you know, hard facts about what that is. Like some people, you know, what is a long period of time to one person may, may be not a long period of time to another person. So we were very clear about what those were. I would add that there's, there's definitely room for innovation here. Because you know, my, my typical experience, like even this morning when I was in clinic, we put in an hour and a half visits for our, our new evaluations. And at the end of that time, after going through all of the different domains of the DSM-5 criteria, as well as trying to get a good handle on what a child's developmental history has been, oftentimes you're left with, you know what, I have lots of concerns too, but I don't have enough information yet to feel convinced to make a diagnosis. And part of that is just all of the things you unfortunately have to do from a medical perspective, from having a, a doctor's visit, there are things you unfortunately have to do. And even just going through all of the questions, just as you say, and, and getting thoughtful answers to them and being able to explain what I mean when I ask about, do they understand the to and fro of conversation or term taking? And say, well, what do you mean by that? It's a long conversation. Like, I think there's always going to be a place for that because I've had the experience where Patients say yes to everything, um, but it's, it's that you have to go through and you have to explain each thing. And even after explaining it very carefully, it was, oh, well, actually, not so much. But I think you know, being able to, to triage and being able to gain additional information beforehand would be tremendously helpful. Right now, we send out a good uh, 23, 24 page packet to families that we ask them to fill out beforehand. But again, right. all in paper. If this was electronic, you could potentially even ask the question in such a way where scores are automatically calculated and factored. You could even do quality control and internal validity testing in one piece. And I, I think there's a lot of room for that. Yeah. And in fact, one of the things that the app did was so under each question, it gave you an age breakdown. So if your child is 18 to 24 months, this is what this particular criteria looks like from 24 to 48 months and so forth. So, because again, even then, what a 24-month-old is doing versus a four-year-old on the same question are going to be very different. So you're trying to contextualize it. You know, it would also be cool would be, depending on the age of the child, if there could be two components to the app where there was an adult section where you would fill it out for your kid, and then there was a kid section right. that would be completely a different experience where it would use, you know, more pictures and more experiential ways of answering the same questions from the child's own point of view. Right. Just to provide as much information as possible. So when we first started to be concerned about Colin, one of the things I did was I ended up on the Autism Speaks website and they had a side-by-side -side video player that showed you two children, one autistic, diagnosed autistic, one non-autistic, engaged in the same activity. And that was, I mean, I just looked and I was like, wow, that's Colin on the left side right there. Like everything was him. And it was so clear to see those kinds of experiences shaped me. It's why I got very passionate about redesigning the autism spectrum, which, is, as I mentioned, is an ongoing project. But um, the first iteration was pretty well received, and now I'm kind of working on the next iteration. And again, the goal there is to help autistic people and their caregivers and parents kind of have a better toehold or a better visualization of, of strengths and challenges. Because again, I think once you kind of demystify things and remove the kind of cloud of confusion, you're more able to seek opportunities and approach challenges. And there's no reason why the features of the device itself couldn't be used diagnostically. Like you say, the device could actually be watching the autistic child, maybe doing some eye tracking from the camera, or maybe just watching how the child is behaving while a certain movie is being played on the device, and then that data is also being used to formulate a diagnosis as well. Yeah, they have tools already. When I was at the Organization for Autism Research Board meeting last month, we were down in Phoenix, which you guys might have heard has a lot of great programs, big time. I think it's called the most autistic-friendly city in the United States. But we were at uh, one of the key programs there in, in the lab, and the mother would sit in a chair with the baby in her lap and they would be checking eye connections. The mother can't look at anything. She has to look in a completely different area not to confuse the visual tool. And I know that they've had some good success 
doing that for the regional area. And I don't remember the name of the app, but I think there's several out there. There was one in Australia as well that did super early diagnosis on an iPhone. So there's a lot of stuff evolving in that area. Kathy, I believe, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, I think Harvard is also doing a study where they ask you for a two-minute video clip of your child in a social setting like a child's party using artificial intelligence to analyze the video. And I think their accuracy rate is very high. So it's looking at certain characteristics like movements, interactions, tracking, you know, and and listening to audio. Because I believe, you know, obviously the, the sooner you can start getting services and support, the better your chances are, you know. That's something where, well, everyone films their kid. Everyone has a video at home. And so if it's like, hey, just upload your video and we'll give you a sense whether, and again, not to diagnose, but to say, hey, you should go see somebody. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a first step. I think those kinds of tools are, are really exciting. The research going into using EEG or the, the eye tracking or pupil dilation, looking at different stimuli, you know, it's, it's definitely a tremendous amount of ongoing work. So far, nothing's quite met the criteria for being able to truly be diagnostic where you've got good separation between a large population of controls and children who then go on to develop autism. But it's de- they're definitely getting closer every day. And I, I think something in this realm from an electrophysiologic standpoint might eventually get to the point where it's part of the supportive criteria. I think we're getting closer and closer to identifying things that are more consistently different. So ultimately, what is the most reliable diagnostic criteria? Because our daughter, Noah, you know, her pediatrician said she's not on the spectrum now. Her psychologist is saying she thinks she is on the spectrum. Is there one single most reliable criteria? Right now, you know, we all have a sense of autism being a a lot of different things. And unfortunately, we're still in the realm where it's a descriptive diagnosis. You know, it's based on either the interview with a clinician, like a psychologist or neurologist, a psychiatrist, pediatrician. Um, there's also more structured things like the ADOS, which is basically just a structured observation through multiple different realms. But at the end of the day, we've, we've still not moved beyond kind of an observational and interview of parents who are making observations, diagnosis. We don't have uh, biomarkers or an endophenotypes or, or anything that's to that um, level that have become diagnostic. And that's a billion dollar question right now, is what can we find that we could use um, that could help be a tiebreaker or even just as a screening tool. And we're still, we're still looking for things that are strong enough that could be employed at a population level. So we've talked a lot about diagnostic tools and things to help those with autism. But, you know, these days where the spectrum is so broad, we're seeing a lot of those with Asperger's wanting to be empowered. And we're hearing a lot of, hey, uh, we're Asperger's and that's not a bad thing. Just celebrating the neurodiversity. And Temple Grandin mentioned this in, in that TED Talk as well. Just celebrating the unique traits of those with Asperger's and the talents that they might have that other people don't. So are there apps out there that celebrate autism or that find a way to capitalize on the special talents of somebody with Asperger's? I'm sure there might be something, but I think what we're finding in tech, at least I've seen over the last maybe six or seven years is more companies are looking to hire people on the spectrum. And they're going out of their way. And I think that then feeds to this uniqueness that you're referring to, Steve, around how can we celebrate the diversity? Well, that starts within the workplace and then knowledge. And people get who are not like the rest of us here, for the most part, have a family member or two on the spectrum. And I think that's going to allow people to be happy and excited about hanging out with the people on the spectrum. Yeah. I mean, Temple Grandin is a great example of how autistic thinking can be super beneficial to society. You know, I'm thinking an app could even be as simple as something that just pairs people up with the profession that they might be best suited for. Uh, Like uh, Noah already says that she wants to work for NASA, which is pretty amazing. When I was (laughs) 10 years old, I had no idea what I wanted to do. (laughs) But, you know, just something to encourage 
to say, you know, this is not a big issue. And in fact, there's a lot of benefits and there's a lot of great places for you in tech, in science, in math, et cetera. And just to, to encourage that and to celebrate these kind of traits. You know, there's a lot of apps out there now that are doing this. And I don't know that they're specifically autism centric, but, you know, Minecraft is one. One of the things you hear about Minecraft is it inspires creativity and building. And it's very, you know, so you can be in this world alone or you can join a Minecraft server and be with others. And, you know, I've known autistic kids who actually create a server together, ask what you might call Asperger's kids who get together and create these servers and have these interactions with each other that might be a little bit more difficult in person. And so Minecraft is one. My son Martin uses um, a visual programming app called Hopscotch. So he's learning to make games. And Colin has actually recently gotten interested in what he's doing. So he's watching over his shoulder. So it's basically visual programming. So, you know, you, you define an object, then you a- assign attributes to it and then variables, but it's all very visual. So I think those things are a great toehold into being able to create something that actually is programmed. Again, my whole lens is maybe it is an autism centric app, or maybe it's just one that is, you know, quote unquote, autism friendly. Right. And how about tools for adults like my brother? Kathy, your brother. I mean, is there anything out there? Yeah, this comes up in conversations with researchers, and there's so much out there for children because you guys who have children are technologists, where my parents and your parents, Steve, were not, and technology was a different place. So, those that are adults now, there's a lot of issues with adults and access for people on the spectrum. It's not just lack of apps. But also, you know, just because people sort of get ignored after a certain point. They're no longer in school. Are they in a group home program? Or do they have a job? Or do they have a project work type place? And so I think that there's a lot of opportunity there. I think part of it, the value of having autistic people in the workplace and learning and getting educated and getting into technology is giving them an ability to build apps for themselves. And I think there are, at least in the Bay Area, there's an autistic group of people on the spectrum who are in tech, who help each other and help each other with work and social behavior. I mean, it's mostly men, but there's some women at that group as well. But I I think it's even broader than the fact that there's not an app. There are some real issues around accessibility for even healthcare for people on the spectrum. I mean, you guys haven't thought about it yet because you don't need to, but what happens when your child no longer is going to see the pediatrician who she or he is very familiar with. How do we get PCPs who are not really interested in caring for people on the spectrum because they don't get the feedback of how they're treating the patient with, you know, with the kind of return that they are looking for as a physician? I mean, and maybe Alexander knows more here, but there's so much opportunity to help people on the spectrum who are adults. And I just think we have to get the word out that let's look at all the problems and the use cases and what can we do to help. Yeah, this has actually been a a broad issue that actually affects more than just the autistic population, but a lot of the conditions that we treat in child neurology have shortened lifespans, and we've been getting better and better at helping these children grow into adulthood. And now there's all these adult neurologists, let alone internal medicine physicians, who have no idea what these conditions are since, you know, that they haven't seen them since medical school, And, and now they're being asked to help manage them. Um, the same way, you know, these children with autism that now are, you know, being, you know, functional adults in the society, whereas before they may not have even had a diagnosis or it was an incorrect diagnosis. And so where, where did they go? And so um, working on transitions um, and then the, the transitional process from pediatrics into internal medicine or in family medicine, um, this has been a big push of many of the medical societies over these past couple of years. We have m- multiple roundtables and discussions about this at the national meetings now about what's the best way to do this. You know, how do we uh, measure you know different implementations of this and what seems to work and what doesn't seem to work. But I think this is an ongoing story, specifically for the autism population. You know, all all child neurologists are actually board certified in adult neurology too. In one sense, you know, because we see ourselves as a subspecialty of neurology. Period. But it also gives us the benefit of we can continue to see our patients into their 20s and until they get established with providers that feel as comfortable taking care of them as we do. But it's, it's been a benefit that we have that some of the other specialties don't. 
But I, I agree, this is definitely a field where more education and at the medical school level and in adult practice needs to be a bigger focus. We need to have a telehealth solution for adults on the spectrum, or even you know, a telehealth solution for children with autism in rural settings with practitioners who can help. And I think that's just another void that technology and education and need need to come together. It's so true. Like where I live, well, in Brooklyn, even we belong to a parents listserv. And the questions are always like autism friendly pediatrician, autism friendly. The big one is autism friendly dentist, you know, (laughs) because it does require a certain kind of sensitivity and skill level. You know, you're so grateful when you meet that dentist who's patient and caring or a barber, even, you know, a barber who's willing to deal with your kid moving around and you know, sensitivity to the buzzer or the scissors and phobias, and it takes them twice as long to do a haircut. So it's great when you find those people. I know. I was thinking the same thing, as well as the the idea of an app that's just used to educate these different service providers on autism and, and how they need to adjust their methods, whether it's giving a haircut and so forth, just to make it tolerable for those with Asperger's and autism. Telehealth is, is, I think that is something that is on the way. I think that the barriers to that at this point are fortunately no longer technological. It's basically the law and making sure right. everyone's time is getting reimbursed appropriately so that they can actually sustain their, their jobs and their careers doing that. Is there anything else that you guys want wanted to just to make sure that we talk about? I've been trying to create a Google Doc of technologies available. Autism Speaks has some stuff, but some of it's a little stale. And it would, there's so much opportunity there. And I just, I think the people who have loved ones want to know where the tools are. How can I find them? You know, where can I go to get the resources needed to, to look at my options here? I think there's a tremendous need for that. I've looked at the Autism Speaks website too, you know, even before this podcast, just to see, okay, you know, how many apps are on here listed? And there's more than you can count, and it's in, in categorizing them as one sense. But you know, I think something similar to an Amazon or even like a, a Google with or a Yelp, where you have a system where all the apps can be evaluated by by the end users, and there's there's reward given to people to, to designing high quality apps such that more traffic gets driven to them, and and the apps that need additional assistance can realize that that they're the user base could be much larger if they focus on design or focus on making their app more useful. I think right now there's, there's a gap in the feedback process. Each app or each company hears from their own users but doesn't see what, every, what all the feedback that everyone else is getting. Yeah, I would, I would love to participate in that. I actually know of a couple resources now that I think are um, in, in the right direction but rough around the edges for some of the reasons you've already alluded to. And I know of a group that's actually trying to, to do something similar as a resource. But I think while technology has created this amazing ability for people to connect and get information um, and share information, other than Autism Speaks, it's all very decentralized. I'm sure we each have our opinions about Autism Speaks as well. I'm saying centralized and yet I think there has to be another kind of resource where parents can, caregivers and autistic people themselves can go and learn about this and and rate and review and get feedback and drive the technology forward. That's exactly the vision we had for the organization research tech committee, which I just didn't get enough traction on. If you guys have interest and you know some others, we could put a little, you know, committee together and connect once a month and just get movement on this. Sure. That would be great. I'd love to be involved. Yeah, we can get started on that. That's awesome. I just want to give one low tech plug here. So my wife and I are both allergic to any kind of fur bearing animal. So we got some chickens. We got <laughs> we are now raising four backyard chickens and my daughter just like loves these chickens so much. In fact, they just came home and like it was a funny thing cuz we also have a 4-year-old. And so the 4-year-old is running after the chickens and the chickens are freaking out. I'm watching this happen just now. And Noah walks over and just carefully just picks up one of the chickens and the chicken immediately calms down and Noah just sits down and she's very calm and with the chicken. And just, it's just amazing. I can't really uh, say enough good things about raising backyard chickens. (laughs) (laughs) 
You belong in Brooklyn. That's where I live. There's people raising chickens. We I, live in an apartment, so we that would not be a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, now Noah is like obsessed with learning everything about chickens. You know, as as you described, Michael. She but think, some people have had very good luck with with animal therapy. It's been really a great experience. Well, they are expressive, and they don't. They're. It's not facial expressions either. I guess that could be a plus as well. <laughs> I think you're right. Yeah, I think it's all body language. All body language. Yeah. yeah. Well, Kathy, Michael, Dr. Cohen, thank you so much for joining me today. And I look forward to uh, keeping this conversation going and to getting some real work done. Yeah, that would be yeah. great. Yeah, thank you so much for doing this. Fantastic. I enjoyed talking to all of you. It's really nice meeting you. It was great talking with all of you as well. And uh, thank you for checking out another episode of Device Squad, the podcast for the mobile enterprise from Propellix. Bye-bye, everybody.